that we do have to move on to discussion session two, which is um, ablation. Um, I believe that quite a few of you are quite keen to um, get some points across here. Uh, Professor Heinrichs, you're deeply involved in new technology assessment for contact force ablation, I believe, and um, working with a catheter ablation in an MRI environment, the first mm -hmm. group to do that. And I also know Professor Couch, I know you have some points you'd like to make, but um, who would like to start perhaps on the first point, contact force for ablation, measuring of contact, is it the future, and what's the best method? Um, Professor Heinrich, would you like to I start? I can start, yeah, okay. I can start addressing that issue. New technologies have always been very, very important, important in interventional uh, electrophysiology. Over the last two decades, we step by step implemented uh, new technologies into our uh, treatment workflows to improve the quality of care for our patients and to reduce risks. Most of, if we look to catheter ablation, uh, most procedures. Uh, are still performed with point-by-point -point radiofrequency uh, energy application, and I personally believe it will stay that way, that that point-by-point -point radiofrequency ablation will be the mainstream of, of ablation therapy, even in the field of, uh, uh, of atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. For radiofrequency catheter ablation, if we go point-by-point, -point, contact between the energy delivering electrode and target tissue is crucial. And at the end of the day, the biophysics of radiofrequency energy are not that complicated. It's contact dependent. Good contact, good lesion, good result. Poor contact, poor, poor lesion, poor result. That forms uh, the, the, the basis for the technological development of contact or force sensing uh, technologies. These technologies aim on uh, helping the physician to, to assess, measure, and optimize the contact between the ablation electrode and, and the target tissues. Three technology platforms are currently in the, uh, under intense clinical uh, evaluation. All of them work with surrogates for contact. There is no direct measurement of contact force in gram. Some publications suggest that, but it's, it's not the case. They all work with surrogates. It's either a change of impedance between the, the ablation electrode and the tissue. It's the distortion of a coil that is transferred into a contact signal, or it's an optical uh, technology that, that gives information about uh, force sensing. My personal impression is that uh, it should significantly improve the ability to uh, effectively treat patients with complex uh, arrhythmias. However, at this point in time, we have to, to, uh, to say that uh, clear-cut clinical <coughs> results on the beneficial effect of these technological platforms are still lacking. We, these these uh, technologies add costs to the procedures Costs are always critical uh, in, in, in these settings, and we have to wait for data from prospective randomized trials proving that we really can gain benefit on the efficiency or safety level by implementing these technologies. Gerard, may I challenge you, because uh, if I, before we go uh, with Hein and, and the probe here, is a matter of really... Um, getting deeper lesion or wider lesion and is uh, is really contact forces is the one that can help you in understanding whether your lesion formation is deeper and larger or you think there are some other technologies that probably even without contact sensor provides uh, much better and reliable results and reproducible results in terms of depth and uh, lesion extension. Very good point, Angelo. At the end of the day, it's, it's durability of the lesion. We need stable lesions over time, especially in the field of atrial fibrillation, to, to reduce the, the recurrence rates. Um, alternative technology that also provide direct information on lesion generation, uh, echo uh, technologies, that, that visualize lesion formation. There are some HIFU platforms that, that could give you uh, uh, comparable results. 
are in the are in the development pipeline right now and, and also look promising. Um, what I see at the end of the day is that we implement either direct visualization of lesion formation or force sensing into an algorithm that uh, includes catheter stability over time with 3D mapping technology, duration of energy application, electrical parameters, decrease of, uh, of electrograms as a surrogate for, for lesion induction, plus force parameters or plus di direct visualization. It's an interesting field. There's more to come over the next couple of years, but again, we need good studies uh, in order to prove that it's really a step forward. I think the problem is that we still don't uh, know with contact force measurement what's going on in the tissue. So it's just a surrogate uh, marker of our ability to, to deliver better energy or more energy into the tissue. But in terms of uh, safety, for instance, we would like to see uh, how deep is lesion to prevent uh, perforation, to prevent collateral damage, for instance, to the esophagus. So I, I still believe that this is just intermediate uh, technology and maybe technologies that can display the lesion depth like a uh, high frequency ultrasound or maybe technologies that can measure temperature inside the tissue like a microwave sensor equipped catheter could be a really better solution. But still at this stage, uh, I, I don't know what will be the answer, but we need certainly to, to know more what's going on in the tissue. The, the other thing is with contact force technology, I, I believe it's a very good tool for, for teaching uh, fellows to, to get feedback uh, from the tissue, from, from the contact force uh, in measurement uh, about uh, manipulation inside uh, structures like left atrium, which is very important to, to get the feedback, you know, how much you can press on uh, uh, tissue in, in certain areas. So this is a very good uh, tool for teaching, I think. And uh, for clinical use, we have to wait uh, results of trials to, to get uh, data if it's cost effective, if it adds something to, to our ability to, to improve results uh, of ablation. That's clear. Can I make a point? Because I'm curious about your comment about using single point by point ablation. Mm -hmm. I can understand why you want to make sure you have a durable lesion that's stable. But surely, I mean, that's a very time consuming way of undertaking ablation and really what's your view of using uh, the multi-site ablation technology whether it's cryoablation, uh, ablation frontiers type technology for ablation because surely at the end of the day we want to improve the speed of the procedure, the efficacy of the procedure so we can treat more patients earlier on in the disease. At the moment the, the, the direction would be a more, a more prolonged, more laborious procedure with point by point with further verification of lesion delivery. Well, what, what you really want is an all-in-one technology that gives you verification and rapid lesion delivery that any, early, any trainee can learn quickly to disseminate the technology into the wider community. I, I have my interesting point. I have my reservations um, about so-called single single shot devices. I think I have had them all in my hands, yeah. um, and <coughs> none of the technologies that I've seen so far proved proved uh, convincing and proved as effective as point by point radio frequency ablation. I agree that the training phase is longer for point by point radio frequency ablation. But uh, with point-by-point -point radio frequency ablation, you can address the individual anatomy of the patient, which you can't do with, with single-shot devices. The anatomy, you're a slave of the anatomy. You have to do what the anatomy allows you to do. It may be as uh, uh, if effective um, for, to, isolate, to isolate pulmonary veins, but to cure atrial fibrillation, that may be a different, uh, a different issue. If it comes to left atrial macroentroenterocardias, you are very flexible with point-by-point -point ablation. You are not flexible with single-shot devices. Um, I think we have to go into, into randomized prospective studies, comparing the different technological uh, platforms in order to get a clear-cut view uh, on, the, on the options, the different options we have for different patient population. I personally believe that single shot devices may play a role in the very early stage of, uh, of development of atrial fibrillation when it's really a pulmonary vein specific target. 
But when it gets to to more advanced stage of the disease, I got my doubts that we can do as good uh, with with single shot device as we can with with uh, point by point radio frequency ablation. Can I can I um, perhaps raise a slightly controversial point then? Mm -hmm. Because isn't the FDA getting it wrong when they are giving new devices licenses to compare their technology against drugs? What they really should be insisting is that the new technologies compare themselves against the FDA-approved technology of point-by-point -point ablation. I mean, that's the comparison, not point. drugs. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I, I consider it fair. It's a very good point. So you think, the, you're saying that is on top of what we already have achieved with current technology, essentially? Yeah, I mean, if they want to bring a new technology to market, they have to prove that it's either equivalent or superior to mm -hmm. the existing technology, not to the worst thing, which is drugs. It's a very, it's a very good point, and I mean, if we if we come to uh, one of the technologies which was which was not approved in the in the United States for for safety reasons, a single shot uh, technology, uh, it shows that FDA at least looks into into that uh, direction. It was not approved because of lack in efficiency, but uh, safety risks. Yeah, I mean that's a critical determinant, isn't it? It's the safety of the procedure. That's a primary concern. Um, and you need, as you know, very large randomised controlled trials to start proving superiority of one technology over another. The best we can do in most multi-centre trials is prove equivalence of therapy. Um, and really, this issue of dealing with atrial fibrillation, as you all know, is an extremely complex disease. And the earlier we can treat it with a simple one-shot technology, which goes back to the referral, the patterns of referral to our practice, the more likely we are to impact on the disease. Because when you're dealing with someone who's had AF for five years with a five centimetre left atrium, um, you know you're going to be back uh, to treat them, whatever the technologies you use. We, we should really be trying to focus on early presentation with efficient technologies which are safe, I think. I fully share uh, Gerhard's view that uh, we are like slaves of anatomy and every patient has different anatomy, especially when we are dealing with atrial fibrillation. And I, I still believe that tailored tailored uh, ablation point by point uh, with good uh, recognition of lesion and uh, uh, assuring uh, durability of lesion and, and safety would be probably the, the method of choice. I, I had uh, similar like Gerhardt, I had all technologies in hand. Yeah. I have experience with all these balloon and uh, single shot devices. And I must say that I'm not impressed. And, and you have to take into consideration that most of the results with these technologies are done with a high level centers. Mm. So it doesn't work like you have an unexperienced person. You give him this technology and tell him, well, you can do just ablation. Uh, you, you freeze, you, you burn in one shot, and it works. And it will work in, in a, all uh, communities. So I, I think we have to be uh, cautious here. and. I fully agree that we need to really long-term data comparing different technologies, uh, first in high-level uh, expert centers, and then we can uh, disseminate this technology if it works uh, and if it's safe enough as an initial strategy for treatment. Yeah, I also want to join into that and challenge whether there is a difference between a patient with early AF and late AF, right. because as was mentioned, the anatomy is there. And even if you have early enough AF, we all agree we need to isolate the pulmonary veins. And I, I don't see a difference on why an, a single shot device would be more effective in an early AF patient than a late AF patient because the anatomy is there. So I'm also a strong believer in we have to look at anatomy and the best way to adapt to anatomy is, is a point by point, unfortunately. Um, so that, that is one comment. I, I want to also come back to uh, contact force and, and um, raise another critical note there. Of course, every new technology is intriguing because it gives new information and new insights. But the equation is rather complex. It's not only contact force. It's not only the time, how long we apply the force, but it's also the power that we apply when we are in contact. And that all together will define the lesion size and depth, and, and that relates also to the safety issue you were mentioning. So probably we find ways to solve that and somehow understand what happens, but we make everything much more complex. And so the note I want to make is that I also want to look at simplicity. Yeah. And uh, we have to keep our procedures as simple as possible. 
And I don't know whether contact force will really be the, the way to, to keep it simple. And maybe it's a little bit um, challenging, but I wonder whether going back just to temperature feedback may at the end give similar information as a combination of contact force, time, and power. Because in fact, what you will do is heat the tissue and maybe temperature information uh, may, be, may be as informative. So I think it's still a long way to go before contact force is, is, is the real new parameter we, we uh, can rely on. But, but it's something to explore, but it's not ready for prime time yet, I think. Could, could I uh, just add, I, th I mean, I think uh, this is probably a slightly different slant on, on things, but we need to uh, bear in mind that we live in the present, but that the future is very distant. And if we look back 50 years, uh, we weren't able to do, we weren't even able to dream about doing many of the things that we can do now in electrophysiology. And we probably can't dream yet of the things that we will be able to do in 50 years' time. And so while I agree it's important to keep the procedure simple, the way we do the procedure at the moment is with our hands, looking at a screen, standing in a ledge. That is not the way we will be doing these procedures in 50 years' time. None of us will be doing these procedures in 50 years' time. But things will change. And I think that the advent of a te technology that provides a new piece of information which intuitively is likely to be very important. You know, penicillin has never been put through a randomized control clinical trial to assess whether it's good for pneumonia or not. Uh, contact force is likely to be a piece of information that is likely to be beneficial. It's unlikely to be harmful. And sure, it does need to go through the clinical trial route, but 50 years down the line, it is likely that contact force, plus a whole heap of other parameters that we don't yet know about, will be used for allowing us to measure, assess, confirm, and move on with a lesion immediately and perhaps even automatically with a technology that allows real-time electroanatomic imaging tissue thickness assessment. Uh, the other point I would make is that uh, prospective trials of one technology versus another, I don't think there's one good one in the literature. They're always too small. Uh, they're always done in centers where there's a very, very high degree of expertise with all of the technologies. Um, and this is a real problem. Also, by the time the trial has started, the technology has already changed. There's already something new incorporated into the catheter, there's already something new incorporated into the design of the sheath, and therefore you're never really looking at a trial of a technology that is going to be used by the time the results of the trial come out. So these are very, very difficult things to do, unlike a drug where, for example, a, a beta blocker is a beta blocker and it's, it's not going to change and you can trial it in thousands of patients. You can't do this with these kinds of studies. I, I just want to add balance to this <laughs> argument because I, I, everyone has said point, but it's very brief. But I think um, one size fits all technologies may well be um, what's used in the majority of patients who have paroxysmal AF. They're not presenting with persistent mm -hmm. AF. Right. And by early AF, we mean early paroxysmal AF. Mm -hmm. So I think that point by point may not be the, the treatment of choice, but the trials are needed. I just wanted to add balance to the <laughs> argument there. Okay. Thank you.